Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, it's Susan Kaufman here from Attitude Magazine. You're listening to Attitude's ADHD Experts broadcast. Thanks so much for joining us today in our first broadcast of the new year. Today's ADHD expert is brought to you by Attention360. It's a online communication portal that makes it really easy for home, school, and medical professionals to coordinate their interventions and leads to, therefore, better outcomes for children with ADHD. It's from the leading education services company, Pearson, and they invite you to try Attention360 free of charge, and you can get started at attention360.com. Today, we'll be talking about executive function. As we know, one of the most difficult aspects of attention deficit is trying to make sense of the symptoms. It's pretty hard to distinguish between attention symptoms, learning disabilities, problems with social skills, and then organizational and time management challenges. And how are we supposed to separate these issues one from another, and, and should we, and in order to come up with appropriate treatment? Um, today, we're so fortunate to welcome Dr. Russell Barkley to discuss how ADHD affects executive function in children and adults. He'll talk about everything from how to identify executive function disorders, the seven major types of executive function and how they control behavior, and finally treatment strategies for managing executive function. Dr. Barkley is an internationally recognized authority on ADHD in children and adults. He's published 21 books, rating scales, clinical manuals, and he's, he's really one of the early leaders in the field. Currently a clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina. <laughs> For more information, visit russellbarkley.org and www.adhdlectures.com. He has some wonderful videos that so many of our readers have found so helpful. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Barkley again with our thanks. Well, thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate that. Now, the purpose of this presentation is to try to clear up some of the confusion surrounding the relationship of ADHD to executive functioning and how both of these pertain to problems with self-regulation. And then I have a few slides at the end on which I will use to uh, address the implications of this view uh, for the management of ADHD. Uh, now, executive functioning has been a widely used term in the literature. Uh, and uh, it's used extensively not only in neuropsychology, not only in clinical psychology and psychiatry, but now has spread into the broader field of general psychology and one could say is almost a fashion trend in the area of education. So it's a widely used term, uh, and it often refers to those cognitive or mental abilities that people need in order to engage in goal-directed action. In other words, it's about behavior toward the future and what mental abilities we need in order to do that. Now, many people consider the term executive functioning to be sort of a mothership, uh, a meta contract, an umbrella term that comprises a suite or set of mind tools. Uh, we will talk about seven of those today, uh, and that these all come under the construct of uh, executive functioning. Most people would agree that the term also is very much related to self-regulation. Indeed, some of us have gone so far as to argue that executive functioning provides the mental abilities that we use to regulate our own behavior toward the future so as to accomplish our goals and prepare for what lies ahead. Many people have argued that these abilities constitute humanity's highest mental faculties. Indeed, I have argued in my recent book on executive functioning that this is the principal adaptation by which humans have evolved and survived on this planet. And of course, most people understand that we're referring here to mental abilities that are mediated by the brain's prefrontal cortex. There have been a number of problems related to ADHD and executive functioning, not the least of which have been many papers that have been written arguing that ADHD is not an executive function disorder, or what I refer to as EFDD, while others of us have made that argument. We're going to explore two topics very briefly here, the neuroanatomy of ADHD and the neuropsychology of ADHD in order to show you that having ADHD virtually guarantees that you are going to have an executive function disorder. And we're going to see that the main reason for the controversy has been that there are at least 
30 definitions of executive functioning people are using, so it leads to a lot of confusion in the scientific literature, not just among lay people. And we're also going to see that assessing ADHD by neuropsychological tests is not a very practical or useful approach. That if one exclusively relies on these test batteries, one is going to find that you miss the disorder in anywhere from 35 to 65 percent of all people who have ADHD. So the problem isn't that ADHD is not an executive disorder, it is. The problem is that if you exclusively rely on psychological testing to evaluate the executive deficits, then you conclude that there are no executive deficits with this disorder in most people. And that conclusion is false, and it's because there are serious problems with these psychological tests. So on the next slide, let's take a very quick look at the neuropsychology and neuroanatomy of ADHD. Now, we know that the prefrontal cortex is what mediates the executive functions. Uh, and this goes back to the 1970s when Carl Pribram was the first person to coin the term executive functioning for what the frontal lobes do, and especially the prefrontal cortex uh, forwardmost in the brain. We know that there are at least three to four circuits in this part of the brain, probably more, but at least three to four major circuits. One of these goes from the frontal lobes, and especially the outside surfaces, back into an area of the brain called the basal ganglia, and especially a structure called the striatum. And this is called the what circuit, or the cool or cold executive circuit. It is this circuit that involves using working memory, which is things that you're holding in mind, to guide your own behavior. So this is where what we think guides what we do, and especially what we think about plans, goals, and the future, and the specific steps we wish to employ to get there. So that's the what network. The second network goes from this same prefrontal area back into a very ancient part of the brain called the cerebellum at the backmost part of your head. And this circuit is known as the when circuit. It is the timing circuit of the brain, and it coordinates not just how smooth behavior will be and the sequence of behavior, but the timeliness of your actions when you do things. As we all know, when we do something can be just as important to how effective it's going to be as what we are proposing to do. So this is the WEN circuit, very crucial circuit in the brain, and it explains why ADHD is such a problem with time management, which most people don't speak about, but that is a considerable deficit associated with the disorder. The third circuit is from the frontal lobes, yet again, back through the central part of the brain, of the frontal lobe, known as the anterior cingulate, and from there we go into the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system. Now, this circuit is very, very important. It's often referred to as the hot circuit. I've sometimes called it the Y circuit, but this is where what we think controls how we feel, and also how we feel about things, our emotions, reverberates back up to control what we think about. And it's called the Y circuit because this is the final decision maker in our plans. When thinking about multiple things we could be doing, this is the circuit that eventually chooses among the options based on how we feel about them, based on their emotional and motivational properties. So it's, it's a very important circuit uh, in the brain. You can now see that these are the circuits involved in the executive system. We know from hundreds of neuroimaging studies that these are the circuits involved in ADHD as well, and that these are the same brain regions that are underdeveloped and underfunctioning in ADHD. So it all makes perfect sense, given all that I've said, that ADHD has to be an executive function deficit disorder. I'll show you visually where these circuits are located. Now, you can see there's our front part of the brain, and we're principally looking at the right frontal lobe in this view. And you can see that we've cut away the back part of the right hemisphere so we can show some of these connections. And you can see the four circuit here. We have from the frontal lobe back into the striatum. It's labeled in white there in the mid part of the brain. That's the what circuit 
That's where working memory guides what we do. The second circuit goes from the frontal lobes all the way back to the cerebellum at the back part of the brain. That's the timing circuit. And the third, which you see here labeled as the emotion regulation circuit, goes from the same part of the frontal lobe through the midline and then goes down to that tiny little amygdala labeled in white here, which then allows control of the limbic system. That's the hot circuit. There is a fourth circuit here that I'll just briefly mention. That is from the frontal lobe to the very back part of the hemisphere. This is where self-awareness takes place, what you see here is called reality testing. This is where we're aware of what we do, how we feel, both internally and externally, what's happening to us. So we can think of this as the circuit for self-awareness. And ADHD also interferes with that circuit as well. So now you can understand the symptoms of ADHD quite nicely by viewing them according to these four circuits. And depending upon which circuits are most impaired and least impaired does determine variation in the kinds of symptoms any given individual is going to have. So it very nicely explains the heterogeneity of the clinical cases that we see. Some people have more working memory deficits, some people have more emotion regulation problems, some people have more difficulties with timing uh, and less difficulties with the others, but they all involve these circuits. So let me reiterate, ADHD is known to involve these parts of the brain. We now understand that these parts of the brain are crucial to at least three or four major brain function networks. ADHD, therefore, must be EFDD. It is an executive function disorder. Now let's talk about how all of this relates to self-regulation, which is a very important function for humans and need only humans self-regulate to the extent that we do. We're going to see this connection by going in and defining self-regulation very quickly here as a three-step process. Self-control involves, first of all, any action we direct at our self. So these are self-directed actions. They're not directed at the environment. The reason we self-direct these actions is to change our subsequent behavior from what it otherwise would have been. So the self-directed action is for self-change. Why do we want to change what we're going to do? Because we're hoping to change the future. We're hoping to make a later consequence more likely or less likely to occur. So self-regulation is always directed at the future, at the later consequences or delayed events. So again, self-control is anything we do to ourselves that changes our behavior in order to alter our future hopefully for the good. Now, we can begin to see what an executive function is by looking at this definition. The executive functions involve at least seven major components, and each of them is an action to the self. So in my book, I've clarified the definition of executive functioning. So instead of relying on the other 25, we can rely on just this one. An executive function is something you're doing to yourself, and you're doing it in order to change your behavior, and you're hoping by changing your behavior that that changes the future for the better. You either gain by getting better later rewards, or you avoid hazards in life, future negative consequences. Now, there are at least seven major executive functions, and it helps if you think of each of them as something that you're doing to yourself. So here they are very quickly. The first is self-awareness, which is simply self-directed attention. That is linked, very importantly, to inhibition, which is self-restraint. Those two are coupled with a third very important ability, nonverbal working memory, holding things in mind. But as I find that, nonverbal working memory is simply seeing to yourself. It is visual imagery primarily, but the other senses can be reimagined as well. Humans use their visual imagery system like a Garmin GPS in order to guide their behavior over time. The fourth executive function, uh, which comes online a bit later, is verbal working memory, which I have redefined as simply self-speech or internal speech. We all have a mind's voice. We all use it to talk to ourselves, to control ourselves. The fifth executive function involves taking the first four and using them to manipulate our own emotional states. 
kind of what you do in cognitive therapy. We learn to use words and images and our self-awareness in order to alter how we feel about things. This is where we get emotional self-regulation. Coupled with that is the ability to motivate ourselves when there are no consequences in the environment. And that comes from doing very much the same thing, using imagery and self-speech in a way that helps to motivate us. And the last executive ability to develop is planning and problem solving. And in my model of executive functioning, this can be redefined as self-play. We are playing with information in our mind in order to come up with new ways of doing things. Play is a two-step process, taking things apart and then recombining them in novel ways to see what happens. Some of those novel combinations are solutions to our problems. So think of planning and problem solving as mental play. Now, as I've argued in my book, these seven executive abilities do not develop all at once. They develop in a sequence, and you need the earlier ones to get the later ones. But what they all have in common is that they involve things we do to ourselves. And we do them to change our automatic behavior. And we do that to improve our future. And you can see all seven of these. And this is my sort of hypothetical sequence in which I think they develop. But by the time we're an adult, we have these seven interacting mind tools, very much like a Swiss Army knife for self-regulation over time to prepare for the future. Because over the 30 years it takes for them to develop, we are going to see a change in what is controlling a person's behavior. If we think about two-year-olds as being on the left side of this slide and 30-year-olds being on the right side of the slide, that's how long these transitions take. But during that 30 years, there's going to be a change in what is guiding behavior. First of all, two-year-olds are controlled by the external world around them. But eventually, we develop the ability to hold information in our mind, in working memory. And we use that working memory to guide our behavior. So there's a transition from external control by the environment to internal control by mental events and these representations. The second one comes about as a result of the first. This transition goes from needing other people to control us when we're young to being able to manage our own behavior using these mental representations. So we go from other control to self-control. The third transition is a timing transition. Two-year-olds live in the moment. They have no conception of time or the future. They don't prepare for anything. But over the next 30 years, because of the executive system, we are going to start to anticipate time. We're going to start to anticipate events that lie in the future. Maybe just an hour or two, but eventually it goes to 8 to 12 hours, then to a day, then to 2 to 3 days. By the time we're teenagers, by the time we're in college, it goes to several weeks. And by the time we're in our 30s, we typically anticipate events that are about three months out. We can anticipate further than that, but on an average day, the average decision we're making about our future falls somewhere in an 8 to 12 week window on time. So notice as we get older, we're thinking about the future and using those thoughts to prepare for that future. And this leads to the final transition. We go from little children who are concerned only with immediate consequences and rewards to people who give up those immediate consequences in order to pursue larger delayed rewards, known as delay of gratification. Very important to our social and occupational success. So over 30 years, there is a transition from what controls human behavior. The executive functions are creating these transitions. And by the time we're an adult, we need to be more under the control of our thoughts and mental representations. We need to be controlling our own behavior. We need to be thinking more about the future and how to prepare for it. And we need to be working for delayed consequences and not be so governed by immediate ones. That's very important because it shows that people with ADHD are about 30 to 40 percent delayed in those transitions. And now you can understand why people with ADHD are having so much trouble in life. Because they are thinking and acting in ways that are like younger, typical people. They aren't as well under the control of working memory. They're not being 
uh, as self-regulated. They're not able to control themselves due to time and anticipating the future, and they're more likely to opt for immediate or near-term consequences rather than pursue long-term consequences. So let's go back and review how the symptoms of ADHD fit within an executive function view. Here we can see that executive functioning is one thing. <clears throat> it's self-control. But we can split it into two broadband dimensions, inhibition and metacognition. And then we can see that ADHD symptoms are simply another way of referring to these two broad dimensions. The hyperactive impulsive symptoms of ADHD are really just symptoms of a larger inhibitory problem, and the inattention symptoms are really not inattention. They're problems with metacognition, with executive functioning, specifically with working memory, planning, problem solving, and emotional self-control. So now you can see that ADHD is really EFDD, but with the wrong name. We're not going to change the name anytime soon, but we all need to know that ADHD is an executive disorder. Now, there are other executive disorders as well. ADHD differs from them because ADHD cuts a wide swath of problems across all seven of the executive functions. It is possible to have an executive deficit in just one of the seven executive functions. For instance, you could have a problem just with verbal working memory. We often see this in autism, and you can see it in the beginning stages of dementia. On the other hand, some people may have problems only with emotional self-control and not with the others, though that's very uncommon. All of this is to say that while ADHD is an executive disorder, there can be other simpler executive disorders as well. So ADHD isn't the only executive disorder, but it certainly is one of them, and it is one of the most pervasive and far-reaching because it impacts adversely the entire executive system. And what does that do? It leaves the individual incapable of engaging in self-regulation toward the future as well as others. Therefore, if somebody has ADHD, we are going to see problems to varying degrees in all seven executive abilities. And to simply get to the chase here, we can think of ADHD as a problem with self-regulation over time to get to the future and to prepare for that future. In short, ADHD is a form of time blindness. It is a nearsightedness or myopia to the future. People with ADHD can only deal with things that are in the moment or near term. The further out in time events are, the harder it is for them to prepare for them and to accomplish them. So that leads people with ADHD to have a lot of trouble creating long strings of actions in order to accomplish longer term goals. It means that ADHD is really IDD, intention deficit disorder. People with ADHD don't really have an attention problem because they can pay attention to the now just fine. The problem is they don't pay attention to what is coming next, to what lies ahead, to the things they need to be getting done in order to have a better future. Those are intentions, not attentions. And so ADHD is really IDD. We can think about the brain simplistically as a two-part system. There is the back part of the brain where we learn information. This is the knowledge brain. There is the front, front part of the brain where we use what we know for social effectiveness. That is, for how well we succeed in life. So the back part of the brain is for knowing. The front part of the brain is for doing. And as you see here, ADHD separates these two brains so that it doesn't matter what the individual knows. They can't deploy it effectively in their daily life as well as other people are able to do at their age. So there's a disconnect between knowing and doing. And you can be the brightest person in the world with ADHD, but you're going to wind up doing rather silly things. Uh, and you may not be able to live up to your potential because you're not able to put into practice all of the knowledge that you have. So what does this mean? It means that ADHD is not a problem with knowing what to do. People with ADHD are smart. They're as smart as other people are, and they largely know what other people know. ADHD is a problem with doing what you know, the performance part. 
And so here what we see then is a problem with the doing, not the knowing. What does that mean? It means that if you focus on teaching skills to people with ADHD, you lose. They won't work because all that involves is teaching knowledge. It doesn't help them use the knowledge that they have. So the second thing we need to do is not spend so much time on teaching skills, but instead put more time into redesigning the environment to help them remember what they need to be doing at crucial parts in their day when they're having problems with doing what they know they should be doing. In other words, we call this the point of performance, the place in your life at that point in time where you should be using knowledge effectively to accomplish your goals and do what you're supposed to accomplish. And you need to redesign these environments to help the individual prompt what they know and to use it effectively at that point. So dealing with ADHD involves a lot of re-engineering environments to make them more likely to facilitate doing what we know. Now, as I've said, all of these executive deficits are neurological in origin. And for many people, at least two-thirds to three-quarters of them, those neurological problems are a genetic problem. They're inherited. In about one-fourth or more of ADHD cases, the executive deficits, the neurological problems, are the result of acquired injuries to the brain, often during pregnancy and early brain development. But the point is this. ADHD is neurogenetic. It's neurodevelopmental. And because of that, that provides an ample justification for using biological interventions, medications, for the management of these difficulties. We can think of ADHD medications, therefore, as neurogenetic therapies. They go to the brain and they help to alter the expression of genes and nerve cells in the brain in order to temporarily improve the symptoms of these executive deficits. Now, one of the greatest findings over the last decade has been that we now have at least 31 studies that show that the longer children stay on ADHD medications, the more normal their brain development becomes over time. So there is now some accruing evidence, not yet definitive, but very promising, indicating that ADHD medications not only are not harmful, but they may well accelerate brain development in children. This would not happen in adults, of course, because the brain's already developed. So there is evidence, therefore, that Medications need to be employed early and sustained longer over development to try and facilitate nearer normal brain development. It doesn't perfectly normalize the brain, of course, but it may help to make it more normal than it would have been otherwise. Very important findings in the literature known as neuroprotection. Now, originally we were very optimistic that you could cognitively train the executive system, particularly working memory, by practicing on various devices like the CogMed program or Lumosity uh, on the Internet and practice these brain training games, and maybe they would help to boost executive functioning. But, of course, what we learned most recently is this is not the case. These games do result in some improvement on very specific tasks, but they don't result, as far as we can tell, in generalizing into the person's everyday life and improving their ADHD symptoms. So over the past year, reviews of literature have been very sobering in saying that the promise of these cognitive interventions hasn't lived up to their initial reputations. So practice these games if you want to and play them and maybe you'll get a little bit of benefit out of them, but don't expect them to be the equivalent of the more established therapies for ADHD like medication, behavior modification, cognitive behavior therapy that focuses on executive functioning problems and so on. Those are far more effective. Now, finally, one last comment here. You could try to make a case, given everything I've said, that ADHD creates a problem with diminished capacity and that people with this disorder shouldn't be held accountable for it. But my theory does not make that case. My theory says the problem with ADHD is not with the consequences. It's with the timing. It's with the delay to the consequences. So if you want to help people with ADHD, you don't excuse them from accountability. You do the opposite. You tighten up accountability. You make them more accountable more often to others using artificial consequences and other forms of accountability, and then you help them. But you don't help them by dismissing accountability. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at some other implications for management here. 
I've mentioned CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. There are at least three different training manuals on the market now that have been tested in randomized trials and research that show that Cognitive Behavioral Therapy that focuses explicitly on executive functioning deficits, the problem with inhibition, emotion regulation, time management, planning, and those things. Those interventions are very helpful for people with ADHD, but mainly with adults, not so much with children. The younger the individual, the less likely these interventions will work, and the more likely we should just be using straight behavior modification programs like token systems and daily report cards and so on to help them. But with adults with ADHD, especially if they're on medication, research shows that adding CBT particularly the programs by Mary Salanto or Steve Safran or Russell Ramsey, that these interventions do boost medication effects and help people with ADHD cope better with their executive deficits. Now, all of this is to say, of course, that ADHD is a chronic disability with executive functioning for most people across their lifespan. And since the key to treatment is changing points of performance in the natural environment to help them show what they know, then obviously one key to treatment is the compassion and willingness of other people in order to help the individual with ADHD. How can we compensate for these executive deficits? Well, let's take a look at each executive function, and you can see the kinds of things that we could do. Now, I'm going to pass through these very quickly, but you can go to my ADHD lectures website, and you can see several hours of lectures on the executive system and how to improve it. Number one, we need to compensate for working memory deficits. We do that by making information external, using cards, signs, symbols, sticky notes, lists, journals, and other ways of writing things down and keeping information in front of us to substitute for working memory. We need to make time external by using clocks, timers, computers, counters, and other timing devices that help remind us that we have a time interval here. We need to take long-term projects and break them down into very small steps and do a step a day in order to bridge that gap toward the future. We also need to rely on more external forms of motivation, such as point systems, being accountable to others at work and at school, daily school report cards, and other means of reinforcing the person for accomplishing their goals. We need to make it a win-win, put some external motivation in the work environment. We also need to make problem solving manual. Put it in their hands. Try to take the problem apart into pieces. Make that problem as physical as you can and let them use their hands to try to solve the problem and not just their mind. And finally, on the last slide, and then we'll close, we need to make sure we take steps to boost the self-regulatory fuel tank, because self-regulation and executive functioning is a limited resource pool. And you can expend it very quickly by working very hard for a long period of time and not giving the executive system a break. So we need to give the executive system a chance to heal or to refuel itself. And the way to do this is to, first of all, use a lot more rewards and positive emotions during tasks and work that stress the executive system. Have the individual engage in a lot of positive self-statements, kind of like a locker room pep talk before the game, encouraging themselves to try harder, and they know they can do it, and to visualize, if they can, accomplishing the goal. And then take three to ten minute breaks periodically during tasks that stress the executive system. If necessary, take three minute breaks of just relaxation or even meditation to give the brain a chance to refuel itself. And then, as I've said, visualizing and talking about future consequences can also help replenish the system. And the last box, which you don't see here, it's empty on my screen anyway, is physical exercise. Routine physical exercise frequently during the week can help refuel the tank, give you a bigger fuel tank, and help you cope with your ADHD symptoms better. Finally, you should be sipping on sugar-containing fluids like sports drinks or lemonade, just sipping on them, when you have a lot of executive functioning to do, like taking an exam or doing a lot of work, you'll find that it helps to keep your blood glucose up, and blood glucose is the fuel of the executive system in the frontal lobe. 
Now, I've run on just a little bit longer than I intended, but I hope you found this lecture to be useful. Yes, fabulous presentation. Thanks so much. There's just so much there. Let me just come back quickly to the question of diagnosis. Um, your statement that most um, diagnostics miss 30 to 60 percent of those who have ADHD, at least as I understood it, of the executive function problems. That, Can you clarify that? Because that, that yes, was... that's correct. That's correct. Very intrigued by that. Well, and not only intrigued, they should be, uh, I think, uh, shocked. <laughs> Uh, yes. Because uh, yes. the, the vast majority of evaluations for ADHD, particularly for adults, often recommend that we incorporate in them these neuropsychological test batteries of executive functioning. And this almost has become the standard of practice. It goes unquestioned. It's assumed that these tests are the gold standard for evaluating the executive system. But research over the past decade has undercut this view substantially. Uh, I'll give you just three facts. First of all, there is no correlation between executive function tests and real-world behavior. So the ecological validity of these tests is very, very poor. In fact, there is no relationship at all between executive function tests and rating scales of executive functioning that have become increasingly popular. The second problem is that these tests are not very reliable, they're not well-normed, uh, and because of that, they often give off misinformation. Typically, people with ADHD, especially if they're very intelligent or have anxiety with their ADHD, often pass these tests. So the tests really are getting more at IQ and not really at the executive system. Finally, these tests are not able to predict how well a person will function in daily life. So there's no correlation between these tests and how you do at work, how you do managing money, driving, uh, engaging in self-regulation, how you do at school, and so on. They have a very small relationship with achievement in school, but that's because of IQ. So they're very disappointing in their ability to predict how a person is going to function in major life activities. In contrast, the rating scales of executive functioning that are on the market are superb. First of all, they're cheap, they're easy, they're short. They assess the, con how the Connors and so forth. No, the Connors, my own, the brief, okay, right. are, uh, several, Sam Goldstein's new rating scale. There's at least three mm -hmm. or four on the market right now. But these do correlate with how the person functions, do predict impairment, do predict the presence of ADHD. So I'll give you a comparison. In a study that I did, 30% of adults with ADHD or fewer failed the executive function tests. 89 to 98% of them failed on the rating scale, meaning they fell in the bottom 7% of the adult population. So according wow. to the test, adults with ADHD don't have an executive disorder. According to the rating scales, ADHD is a massive executive disorder. So, so my point is this, uh, you're better off relying on rating scales than tests. If you're going to do the tests, then you need to include rating scales along with them to make sure you're getting a good ecologically valid assessment of the individual. Don't put so much stock in the test results. If the test results are normal, they're meaningless. If the test results are abnormal, they might indicate that an executive deficit is there. But normal scores mean nothing because the rating scales will give you a better indication of how the person is really functioning in daily life. So it's quite a surprise. And yeah, practice very, is now very going helpful. to have to change. Yes, it's right. Absolutely. Um, let me just jump to another a point of great interest to the parents who are listening in. Sure. Um, they would love to hear more about boosting accountability, um, concern about um, what that means for their relationship with their child, which is already um, in many cases is you know tense. Yeah. Um, questions as to whether that means getting rid of accommodations at school. Can you elaborate on the concept of boosting accountability? Well, uh, uh, the interventions for eight. ADHD involve five things, uh, and I'll, I'll just go over them quickly because then, then I can answer the question. First of all, parents need to educate themselves about the disorder, and that leads them to shift from blaming and a moral view of ADHD to a compassionate view of raising a disabled youngster. And with that comes the willingness to make these changes. The second thing after education is medication. So you need to think about that because 70 to 80 percent of people with ADHD will need to be on medication as part of their treatment plan. So you're not going to be able to do it alone in most cases just by psychological or social interventions. But you will need to add those psychological interventions anyway. 
The last two are behavior modification, which is what we are talking about under accountability, increasing rewards, increasing structure, increasing reminders to the individual, and that sort of thing. And the second part of the treatment plan is accommodations. So we don't want to get rid of school accommodations. Accommodation refers to changing the physical environment to help a disabled person perform better. You don't get rid of the disability. When I put a ramp in front of a building to allow someone in a wheelchair to enter that conference center, I haven't gotten rid of their disability, but I've made it less impairing. They can now enter the building and function better than they could have without the ramp. All of the accommodations that we get for children and adults with ADHD are ramps. They're artificial devices. They're prostheses that help people function better. They do not get rid of the disorder, but they can still be very, very effective at reducing impairment and adverse consequences. So by no means should parents be trying to get rid of accommodations. They should be seeking them out wherever they can in order to change the environment to help the child with their executive deficits. So for instance, a very simple one is making sure that assignments are broken down into very small pieces, much smaller quotas of work with frequent breaks in between so that the individual can restore their executive system and not tax it too greatly. In addition, you could have the child sitting closer to the teacher at the front of the room. That's an accommodation. In addition to that, you could do some modification by adding in points and other rewards and tokens and using a daily report card at school to evaluate the child at the end of each class and then linking that report card up with privileges at home for a successful day at school. Notice what I'm doing here. I'm focusing on rewards first, not punishment. Accountability means both. In other words, you have to focus on the things the child is doing well and encourage them and provide a lot of external reinforcement to that child or that adult. And then, only after you have boosted the environmental incentives, do you come back and add in mild forms of discipline, like taking away points, like taking away privileges, and so on for the individual. But you don't start with punishment because it will fail. You start with boosting rewards, and that's what I mean by accountability. Okay, that's, that's helpful, um, because I think there was some interpretation that it meant being stricter or harsher, but you're saying the opposite, in fact. I'm saying the opposite. Um, I'm saying be more structured, be more systematic, be more approving, right. rewarding, catch them as fast as you can when they're good, and then, yes, you will selectively have to use mild forms of discipline, but then they will work, but discipline will not work if there is not sufficient incentives to encourage the person to do the right thing, and it will not work if it is delayed. So swift okay. justice is important okay. in addition to increasing rewards. One, uh, here's, a, here's a question that, that, that is, is um, we hear quite a bit of attitude, and it relates to motivation. Um, many parents talk about the fact that they just don't understand why their children seem so unmotivated. Um, and they feel that they're constantly prodding them to take action. Is this executive function? If so, how should it be dealt with? The motivational issue seems to be specifically of concern to parents of teens and, and kids going into college shortly. Um, oh, of course, of course, and, and well, it should be. So uh, as you saw, one of the seven executive functions is the ability to self-motivate. Self-motivation comes into play when you're put into situations where there are no immediate consequences for what you have been asked to do or the work that you have set for yourself. So you're faced with a situation in which nothing's going to happen whether you work or not. Those consequences come later. Think about homework as a good situation, a good example of that. Whenever you put a child or an adult in a situation where work must be done but the consequences are delayed, people with ADHD are more likely to fail. And that's because they don't have the internal self-motivation in order to get through that situation. And you can carp about this all you want to, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a neurobiological deficit. ADHD really is motivation deficit disorder. So that's why you're going to have to make sure that whenever you put them in situations that involve protracted work in the absence of natural consequences, that you put in artificial consequences into that task. That's what tokens do, that's what points do, that's what having privileges, that's what putting pictures around the child of rewards that they can earn when their task is done, that's what having the child be accountable to you frequently, checking in on them every few minutes to see how they're doing. All of those are ways of adding external consequences into situations where there are no consequences. If you do that, 
they'll work for you. You need to think about ADHD as producing at least a 30 to 40 percent lag in executive development. So the ADHD person's executive age, now we're referring here to people under 30, not fully developed people, but we need to think that their executive age is a minimum 30 percent behind their chronological age. And if you'll think of it that way, now you know why they are struggling. Now you know why the teenager with ADHD has the self-motivation of an 8-year-old, not a 14-year-old, because they're delayed by 30 to 40 percent in the things that would motivate other individuals. That is why we have to step in and provide all of the external structure, the scaffolding, the reminders, the cards, the notes, the journals, the tokens, all of the things that we mentioned today are scaffolding for compensating for these internal executive deficits. And we should do that with the same way that we put ramps into buildings to allow physically disabled people to enter. And that is not with the idea that somehow you're only going to do this for a short period of time and then pull the ramp. That would be ridiculous. You have to do this with the idea that the ramp is a prosthesis. It's an artificial device that helps them to function. And it needs to stay there for a long time in order to help them function in that environment. So yes, your child has a motivation deficit. They can't self-motivate. But the solution to that is not to carpet them. It is to put motivation into the situation, make it a win-win, and use these external motivators to try to get them to work harder than they're able to do without them. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's really helpful. And, and one question here from Susie, um, I think, sums up what a lot of parents struggle with. And, and she says, I just don't understand if his problems adhering to routines and his lack of motivation is neurologic or behavioral, and where does one begin in the other end? I think therein lies uh, well, I think, it's, the struggle. It's, it's a very good question. I, I've gotten it right. for many years in my 40-year career. So, But mm -hmm. given the time, I'm going to cut to a very simple distinction. Uh, the distinction is between can't and won't, and that's really what she's saying here. Now, we are arguing that ADHD is neurogenetic and developmental. It's a brain-based disorder, which means that for the most part, people with ADHD cannot help demonstrating or displaying the symptoms of the disorder. That's not a choice. It's not a lifestyle. They're not going to wake up one morning and smell the coffee and stop acting this way. So they can't behave in ways that other people are able to behave. But there will be times where the individual engages in defiant and oppositional behavior, where they won't do what you tell them to do. And indeed, two-thirds of ADHD children eventually develop this second behavior problem. And so you can see why parents would have a tough time deciding, well, which is it? Because sometimes it's both. So here's a very simple rule. If the child starts what you ask them to do, but is unable to complete it because of their distractibility, inattention, and hyperactivity, that's ADHD. That's a problem with they can't do it. On the other hand, if you ask the child to do something and they refuse, that is not a neurodevelopmental problem. That is defiance, and that needs to be dealt with using a different set of tactics. And you can read more about that in my book, Your Defiant Child, which is designed to help parents deal with this kind of willful uh, disobedience. So if they don't start it right away, it's they won't do it. That's volitional. If they do start it but can't complete it and get off task and get a lot wrong, that's ADHD, and that is a handicap. Okay. Um, but the defiant, oppositional defiant disorder is often linked with ADHD, is it not? Yes, it is. Two-thirds of the cases of ADHD develop oppositional disorder within two years of the onset. But part of the reason for that is that ADHD causes half of the symptoms of oppositional disorder. Half uh -huh. of the eight symptoms for ODD are emotion symptoms. They have to do with anger, hostility, impatience, and frustration. And ADHD is causing those emotions. Uh, so if you have ADHD, you are already halfway down the road to a diagnosis of ODD. What you don't have yet are the social conflict symptoms, which is the refusal, the defiance, the arguing uh, with other people. That's social conflict, and that's learned. And so the emotional problems that contribute to ODD are due to ADHD, but the arguing and the defiance that you get can be learned very quickly within a family if the family isn't handling those problems correctly. So ODD has two causes, social and neurological. The neurological side is ADHD. That's why when you treat ADHD with medication, you often see as much improvement in oppositional behavior as you see in ADHD behavior. 
but only if you treat early. The longer the oppositional behavior goes on, the more likely the social conflict has developed, the more likely it has been learned, and therefore the medication will not get rid of it completely. Okay, and very interesting. Um, managing time, you mentioned that, that, that time blindness is a characteristic of executive function disorders. Um, we have a, a wonderful question here, I, I, not wonderful for her, but, but a, a very poignant question from a mother who's six-year-old, very bright child, um, child who plays chess and knows every country in the world, um, cannot, cannot manage a, a routine when he gets home from school. So she says frequently he goes in the shower and then becomes obsessed with playing with bubbles, and she's clocked him in two hours in the shower before she's finally intervened. Yeah. How, how is a parent, um, what are her, are her expectations part of the problem, and how are parents over time to address what you described as a developmental lag? Um, yes in expectations for children. Yeah, well, I, I think there's, there's two disorders. issues here. Uh, first of all, she's quite right that uh, these children do have a lot of problem with adhering to schedules on their own uh, and sitting down and accomplishing work, particularly work they don't want to do on their own because, again, it's not motivating. It's not rewarding. They'd rather do anything else that offers an immediate reward or that is certainly immediately comfortable for them than that. Also, I want you to keep in mind, remember what I said, you can exhaust the executive function fuel tank very quickly. And the school day does just that for ADHD children. So you do not want to be doing schoolwork once the child gets home from school. You want to take a break. You want to let them, if they want to, take a quick shower. We're talking 15 minutes here, set a timer, turn off the water, and then obviously the child can get out of the shower, dress, and now we're ready to start. Maybe they need a snack. Maybe they need a break. Maybe they need to go out and do some exercise in the house or outside in the yard. But do not do something that taxes the executive system. Give it a break. And then maybe within an hour after arrival home from school, we can sit down and begin to tackle the work that needs to be done. But even then, it needs to be broken up into short intervals. So you do what I call, there's the 10 and 3 rule. 10 minutes of work, 3 minute break. 10 more minutes of work, 3 minute break. It doesn't have to be based on time. You can set a, a quota of the number of problems. Do five problems, take a break. Do another five, take a break. So you need to intersperse the work with frequent breaks in order to keep that executive system from being exhausted by the task. It also provides, of course, an opportunity to encourage the child, show approval, give some points or tokens, uh, and other ways of rewarding the child for the work that they've done. But don't expect them to sit down and do 50 math problems at a time. Because that tells me the problem is you, not the child. You don't understand the disability. If you understood the disability, you would never give somebody that many problems to do at one time. So back to this particular question. The parent does need to limit the amount of time in the shower by using a timer, uh, setting that timer, and telling the child when that timer goes off, you are coming in and shutting off that water. Uh, or whatever else they may be doing in which they're uh, having a fun time. Maybe it's playing on the Internet or playing video games. But in any case, you set the timer, you give them a little break, and then you shut the device off. Then we get into work, but the work is always very brief periods interspersed by periods of break, exercise, and reward, and then go back and do the work again. Okay. I think the interesting thing about what you're saying is um, if this person was expecting this child to develop the ability to manage the schedule himself. Not going to happen. It's going to happen, yeah, and you're saying not going to happen. Not Limit happen. the power time. You're, yeah. I, I come back to the point I made earlier. I don't care how bright you are, your executive age is 30 to 40 percent below your chronological age. That's what parents have to look for. They have to lower their expectations and lower their strategies back to that executive age and not expect this child to be doing what other people their age are doing on their own, because that is a disaster. That is what leads to the conflict, the fighting, the yelling, because you expect normal, they can't deliver normal, and everybody's upset. So you need to be thinking about, if my child is age 10, he is more like a seven-year-old when it comes to his organization, his planning, his time management, his self-control. How would I deal with a seven-year-old? And that will give you a lot of ideas about how to approach that child, but you never approach them as if their executive age is equivalent to their chronological age. What does that mean for college? College is so much concern about you know high school seventeen year olds headed off yes. to college, and if, if they're thirty percent younger, I mean, what what is your advice to parents of college students who, oh, high school students who clearly are not um, are not prepared to manage well, life in college on their own? 
it means, as you imply, there are, there are going to be big problems. Like, first of all, this explains why only 5 to 10 percent of ADHD children ever go to college and finish college. Even though a third of them start college, uh, the vast majority of them never finish it because college, more than any other environment, taxes self-regulation, self-organization, and executive functioning. It's why a third of ADHD children don't even finish high school. So first of all, I want parents listening to me to focus on let's get through compulsory education before you visualize yourself at Yale or Harvard. Because if you've got an eight-year-old and you're already seeing this child in the Ivy League school, you are way too far ahead of this game. We need to get this child through this year, next year, and eventually through compulsory education. Focus on that. We'll worry about college when the time comes. Then when they go to college, there's a number of accommodations that you can seek out in the college environment. But basically, you have to turn that college campus uh, into an environment that could handle a 12 to 15 year old coming into that campus as far as their organization is concerned. So what does that mean? Well, look at the books by Pat Quinn and others on college and you'll see a lot of accommodations. But first of all, it means you've got to declare your disorder, you have to go to the Student Disability Services Office, provide the documentation, and they will help you get the accommodations that you need to help to compensate for this delayed executive age. It can be things like taking a lower course load, making sure that the professors understand ADHD and are handpicked for the student, getting back up each day through student disability services, that's the place that will make you more accountable for the work that you need to do. Uh, places to study, groups to study with, more organized people that can uh, help, help you study who have been through the course before. There's lots of accommodations like this for school, but the first thing is to recognize that you're sending somebody who's 12 to 14 off to college. Right. What would you need wow. to do to have a 14-year-old succeed at college? And do those things and it can help. Start with small colleges. I prefer to start with a community college two-year system. If they can handle that, move up to four-year university. Uh, rather than start with four-year university, but if you find yourself at a university setting, it needs to be a smaller college and you need to make sure they have a very good student disability services program for ADHD. That and medication and you should be able to get them through. <laughs> okay. Dr. Barkley, um, I can't thank you enough. People, uh, one person posted, could Dr. Barkley please speak to us each week? Um, <laughs> very My helpful. Pleasure. So thanks again, Dr. Barkley. Uh, super pleasure. helpful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Hope to see you back at Attitude next week. Thanks. Well. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.